So I, I got on a plane yesterday and flew out here. It was 105. I think it was like our 18th straight day of 100 plus <laughs> degree weather, 75 degree humidity. And I called my wife last night. I'm like, I'm going to have to buy a jacket. <laughs> and she says, uh, she goes, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> You're right. Because they don't make clothes for giants in California. <laughs> so uh, bear with me if I'm shaking in the next five minutes. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, so, uh, in 2014, uh, Tony Donan, uh, well, I guess 2012, Tony Donan started a school in Chattanooga. Um, it's a regular public school and then it takes like kids just like every other public school. Um, they, the only difference is they have to apply and the application is uh, last name and zip code and then they get in like per capita. So, normal kids, we get kids on a third grade reading level showing up as freshmen and we get kids that are, you know, maybe MIT bound. Uh, I guess Berkeley bound out here. Um, sorry, um, they're, uh, they're showing up, and, and you know, you know the whole the whole range. Um, extremely diverse. We bus in kids from every school in our district, all all the high schools um, in our district. There's 17 high schools. Uh, they all have seats, so it's kind of per capita. Big schools get a lot of seats. Small schools don't get many seats uh, or as many seats. But every every school is represented, so it's it's a pretty diverse uh, group of kids. In fact, it's, it's truly diverse. It really, really represents what's, uh, what's going on in our, our location geographically. So in 2014, um, I was teaching uh, AP Calculus and Computer Science at a traditional public school, one of the biggest ones in the area. And uh, I was coaching basketball and I got fired. I got a new principal. Uh, she had a guy that she wanted to coach basketball. And so she came in and she was like, I know you had a good season, but we're going to go another direction. And, that sucks. So I, I was like, well, okay. Uh, I had gotten into teaching, frankly, because I was pretty good at math and I wanted to coach basketball. And in Tennessee, you can't coach basketball if you're not teaching. So, well, it's easy to find math teaching jobs. So, there you go. Um, well, ten, 10 years in, I get fired. So now I'm kind of struggling. She wanted me to stay and teach, but I couldn't imagine staying in the school that I've been coaching at for a long time and teaching. That didn't seem right. Uh, so I called Tony at the STEM school and I uh, said, hey, you know, I've got some stuff going on and I'd love to come talk to you here. I had never wanted to work there before because you couldn't coach, but I thought this might be a good time to transition in my life and career. So I was like, you know, I'm interested in coming to work with you if you have any openings. He goes, well, actually, I've got this crazy idea. He goes, I want to open a fab lab. So I don't know if you know what a fab lab is, uh, but at a making conference, I figured most of you did. So if you don't know, just think like, he had about $80,000 to buy stuff with. And he wanted to put it in a room, and he found out that MIT had come up with this idea a decade previously to say, like, this is the stuff you should buy if you have $80,000. So we basically followed their model and bought their stuff, and uh, we put it in a room. And uh, so he called me and brought me in. So we're sitting down talking, and uh, he's like, well, I have to interview you. This is a, a normal school district. You have red tape. I had to formally apply online and go through a formal interview process. And he's like, but before you interview, he goes, you need to make sure it's the right fit for you. So we, we know that, that you're who we would like to have come and do this. I had a background in IT, and there's a lot of kind of IT stuff. So he's like, um, he's like, but before you do that, we won't interview anybody here unless they've taken a, a tour that was written and delivered by our students. So, OK. So uh, he sets me up with this girl that takes me on a tour. The girl is a 15-year-old student from uh, a really rough neighborhood, rough school. The school that she came to us from is, is one of the lower performing schools in the state. And uh, she's giving me the tour, and frankly, she could have been like curating a museum, like been a docent at a huge museum. It was amazing. I couldn't believe how eloquent she was, uh, how articulate she was, what she was talking about, how knowledgeable she was. It wasn't a tour. I mean, it was of the facilities, but she was really showing me. Like, she was talking about what was happening in education. Uh, like, she was better at talking about education than educators are. And it was really impressive. So at the end of the tour, kind of as we were wrapping up, I asked her, I said, you know, Maria, this was, uh, this was really amazing. I said, just out of curiosity, I'm really familiar with the school that she came from. I said, this is a lot different. I mean, frankly, the school is a lot different than any school I've ever been in. I said, this is a lot different. How was how this transition for you as a student? And she said, I'll never forget. She hooked me. I knew right then, like, I want to be there. She goes, oh, it was actually really easy, because here they, they expect us to innovate through iteration. <laughs> OK. <laughs> That's a pretty good deal. <laughs> I, I, I knew that if that's what a kid was, was doing, so she, she went on to, to kind of explain, like she elaborated and she says that um, what was going on was that uh, at that school, teachers were allowed and in fact encouraged to try really crazy strategies and when they messed up, the principal came by and was like, okay, tell me why that didn't work, let's try to fix it, let's try to make it better. 
And she said because they launched that, and then they also came up with a pretty innovative uh, grading policy, grading system, that the grading system actually empowered them to fail. That they were, the students were encouraged by virtue of the system that, yeah, no doubt, that they were, uh, they were encouraged by virtue of the grading system to mess up, evaluate the mess up, identify where the fail points likely were, and then go back and fix it. And she goes, so this is a 15-year-old kid telling me this, right? I'm just like, wow. If this is what the school is turning out in terms of their students, after a year, she'd been there, she was going to be a sophomore, she'd been there one year. I want to be a part of that. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I, I did, I joined on, and uh, what became clear in the coming years is that Maria wasn't the only kid that could articulate this. That there were a lot of students there that could talk about this. In fact, most of them could speak to it. Maybe not quite as fluid as she could, she was really special. Um, but they could all kind of speak to this idea of iterating, designing something, trying to find a, you know, being, identifying a problem, trying to find a solution, and, and trying to come to a, some sort of solution, uh, try to build that solution out. What I realized is that this happened because at STEM school, they assess process skills along with content knowledge. Now, as a normal public school, they still have to bubble in tests, and they still have to say that they know how to factor, and they you know, know how to uh, identify grammar, and they can read. Those are important things. I'm, I'm a dad of two little girls, and I need my kids to know how to read. That's a, I think that's important. I don't know that it's important if they're good at bubbling, but <laughs> that's a conversation with central office people out here. Uh, <laughs> So what we did at the STEM school is we started coming up with formalized ways, and we weren't reinventing the wheel here. The American Association of College Universities have done a lot of uh, valuable work in this arena already. So we wanted to identify how can we assess uh, things like critical thinking, creative thinking, innovation, collaboration, those soft skills, those, those process skills that we needed our students to have in addition to knowing how to factor or knowing how to read. So as we did that, what happened was a substantial shift for us mentally. We realized that we kind of had to rethink the purpose of school. We really had to rethink what we knew about school. So my principal loved to explain to us that like, like we think that teachers have to be the experts, but we realize in the modern era we really get to be the guide, right? Like since the invention of the 90s, we don't have to deliver all of the content, right? Like now kids can access more content than I could ever possibly know. So my role has shifted. It doesn't mean I'm not valuable as a teacher, but it means what I have to offer, how I offer that, needs to have shifted substantially. You know, we talk about the, the, with younger kids, that students, we often think that they need us to hold their hands, but really in education, we, the goal should be to empower them, right? To be independent learners, not require us holding their hands so they can learn. Um, we oftentimes think that, uh, that education, for whatever reason, as kids get older, we silo more, which really seems strange. Right? That as they leave elementary school, we put topics in silos in, and really like, we'll even give them a wing of a building, right? Like, oh, you can't talk about English here, this is the math wing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, my bad. Uh, <laughs> right? And we know that doesn't happen in the real world, right? No business says, oh, you have a great idea, I'm sorry, you're not our math person, we can't let you do that. Like, that's just, it doesn't work that way. Um, and, and even more ridiculous is we think that, like, we see that legislators and policymakers apparently think that getting one or two more questions right on a test is the difference between proficient and advanced work. I, mean, I, I don't think in this crowd we have to talk about that. So we decided we wanted to identify a new goal for school. And this new goal for us became uh, that we no longer were interested in delivering students after high school, that their primary skill was bubbling, and we decided that we wanted to deliver students who were, we wanted to create opportunity for, for every student to become adaptable problem solvers. So kids that could look at any problem and have a skill set that empowered them to do that. Now, that doesn't undermine the importance of foundational knowledge. They need to be solid in STEM subjects. They need to be solid in English. They need, they need to be solid in the fundamental skills. Those foundational skills are part of that empowerment. But we had to move beyond just can they read well and can they do math well. We needed to be doing it for a purpose. So to do that, we visited um, a number of maker spaces. We, we realized the kind of baking and project-based learning were where we wanted to go, how we, would, how we would deliver on that. So we started visiting maker spaces across the country, and this would have been back like 2012, 2013. And as we did, we saw several maker spaces, fab labs, and schools. And unfortunately, um, we saw what, what we kind of saw as kind of a bad trend. So we saw a lot of maker spaces in schools that in academics, in academic settings, formal academic settings, maker spaces were often becoming just rebranded shop classes. And there's nothing inherently wrong with shop. In fact, I think you make a strong argument that like shop class CTE sort of coursework 
really is the prototype for making in a formal academic setting. The challenge is, is identifying what the end goal is. Right? In shop class, oftentimes the end goal is tool mastery. I want you to learn how to use a band saw, and to do that we're going to make these cuts to make the birdhouse, and I'm going to show you exactly which birdhouse I want you to make. Right? Now, if you're learning to use a band saw, that's a great way to teach a kid to use a band saw. The problem is, it typically only engages only those students interested in using a band saw, or making that specific birdhouse that the teacher made. We wanted to kind of use that as just a cog in the wheel. So we knew that we had to build capacity for students to use tools, but we really wanted them to use tools as, well, as tools. Uh, so, so instead of having class, we opened our fab lab and allowed students to just have access. They never had class in the lab. They, it was just on campus. They could get in the lab and use it whenever they wanted. And we facilitated opportunities to say, okay, here's something you might use the lab for. I'm going to get to that in a minute. So basically, we tried to push towards more open-ended design and, and project-based learning with access to these tools. Well, so this, this ushered in um, sort of a, a big paradigm shift for us. We had to redesign the actual process of school. So this is sort of the what school looks like piece. Uh, we could talk all we wanted to about the theory, about you know, school needs to be more student-centered or uh, design-driven or project-driven. But what does that actually look like? Functionally, what does it actually look like as a math teacher for 10 years? Like at some point, I argued for years that when you talked about discovery learning, discovery learning works great, maybe, but as a calculus teacher, like you can't tell me put a good, a well-designed worksheet on the table or a good problem on the table and say go, and that kids are just going to learn to differentiate, right? Like, like that doesn't work. And it, it took us 2,000 years to move from algebra to calculus with the best minds in literally the world working on it. My kids aren't going to do that in nine weeks. I had to at some point be able to be coaching them, putting them in a little more strategic situation. So we, we knew that just say, here's a project we'll learn, right, doesn't work. So what, what can we do? So to do that, we identified six key components that we needed to have present in our school. So with these, you can see there were, we knew first of all we had to provide access, right, this was access to information, unlocking the internet. Uh, if my kids in high school can't figure out what's appropriate and inappropriate, we have problems. So we block some things, I mean some obvious things. But we generally keep it pretty unlocked and give them access. They need access to technology. They need access to experts. And I, as the teacher, am not always the expert. In fact, I'm often not the expert. They need authentic problems and they need autonomy. We turn to flexible scheduling. Um, one of the genius pieces here, a lot of people are like, how did your principal find $80,000? I'll tell you, the way he found it was he didn't spend money on stupid things. <laughs> <laughs> He saved it and bought things that mattered and didn't buy things that didn't matter. And it's amazing what happens. He also bargained with the county when the school was opening. He said, I would like to, uh, I'll take 60 cents on the dollar per student in exchange for you leaving me alone. So we'll take your test at the end of the year, but otherwise, like, I don't want to see you in our building. Don't tell us how to do things. We're going to do things different. And they bought it. Uh, so it worked. So we were taking 60% of the normal student take from the state, uh, or per student take from the state, and we were having extra money. One of the things we did with that money was buy stuff, but we also got gained that autonomy, right? So with that autonomy, we allowed, we transferred that to our students. We used very flexible scheduling. We allowed students to come and go from campus as they pleased when they were older, right, juniors and seniors. And it really empowered a lot of this. We talk a lot about like students having ownership over their work, but then we tell them like, sit here, go there, ask to go to the bathroom. Like we take away the opportunity to own. So we tried to transfer that ownership to them. Next, they need support. Right, this is fairly obvious. We wanted to develop within our teachers the ability to identify where our opportunities and needs to scaffold for our students and then build those scaffolds in. Um, and then within a making context, that looks really interesting. Uh, they needed accountability. We, in education, are usually really good at top-down accountability. Right? The principal says, the teacher says, now the students must submit. Um, but like as Dr. Phil would say, I would ask, how's that working? Right? <laughs> how's that working for you? <laughs> I don't know that that works great. So we wanted to transfer the accountability and let it be peer-to-peer -peer accountability, especially with regards to collaboration. What does accountability look like uh, for students within the, within the setting of collaboration? And then finally, um, we needed to be able to provide them with an audience. So when we looked at these six components, uh, what we realized is that four of the six we could, we could instill easily by just not being lemmings, right? By not just doing the same thing we'd always done because that's how it was always done but just rethinking like how things had to be done, re redesigning the, the function of school. So like things like access, we could take steps to change what access looked like. We could take, take steps to change what accountability looked like. What we couldn't do internally 
was come up with authentic problems, right? It was hard to detrivialize problems. And we couldn't come up with, uh, we couldn't just randomly generate a relevant audience for the students. So for that, we turned to our business community. This, I think, is what Matt really asked me to talk about. So we turned our business and in, in, uh, industry community, and this is where what my job really was. So as the Fab Lab director, I was really the project-based learning coordinator for 11th and 12th grade. Um, and what we did was I spent about 60% of my time out of the building fostering and developing relationships with people in our business community. So in one year, we built 31 partnerships. And it turns out, like, partnerships are really easy when you don't ask for money, and when you only ask for a little bit of time. Um, so what we were asking for in the partnership was simply uh, for the business at the beginning of a project to come out or let us come to them, which was even better, uh, to bring student teams to them. They would present our kids with a real problem that was unique to their business, a problem they were legitimately trying to solve, then leave us alone for nine weeks or so, and at the end our kids would come to them or vice versa, and our kids would present a functional prototype that tried to address whatever problem it was they had, they had submitted to us. So the ask from a business was essentially a real problem in two hours. Right? It's, a, it's a really light lift, and they get to say they're helping public education, which is you know, a feel-good moment for anyone. Well, it turned out, once you do a good job, they start offering money. Like, oh, if we give you a couple thousand dollars, could you do this? But, well, yes, we could. Uh, so, so I want to talk to you about, uh, in, in closing here, I want to talk to you about uh, one partnership that we had. This was one of our very first projects. So we usually ran anywhere from like five to seven projects in a nine week period. And we let our students work on those projects. They worked in teams of three. Uh, and there were some structural pieces I can talk with you about later um, in terms of how we manage the accountability and, and what that looked like without having a formal class time. But basically, uh, here's what happened with EPB. So EPB is our local um, electric municipality. They, they provide electricity to the Tennessee Valley um, in Chattanooga. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, EPB brought us into their executive boardroom. We had about 21 kids, I think it was seven teams of three that are sitting there. Um, they presented a problem to our kids. They say every year we do a holiday window display kind of Macy's style in their Macy's best, uh, corporate headquarters downtown. They said we would love for you to make science fair size like desktop models that we could maybe steal some ideas from. Our designers will look at your models and go, oh, we could do that, and they, they might take an idea or two. So it's an authentic problem. It was very open-ended, and it gave our kids opportunity to go, okay, like that's a good reason to go use tools. Now, this was on like the second day of school, so none of our kids had ever used a CNC router. In fact, it was still in the cardboard at that point. We hadn't opened it. Uh, we had 3D printers that were still in boxes. They never 3D printed. They never used a laser cutter. They'd never done any of this stuff. So over the next nine weeks, our kids started building things and uh, kind of sketching out designs. And I'm new to this. I'd left a math class. I'm not handy. I hired people to change my oil. I was not the expert in this setting at all. Um, so they start working and uh, we show back up and they give their presentation. So during their presentations and their models, uh, the last group that goes unveils this acrylic ice castle. So if you've used laser cutters, you can buy this really relatively inexpensive, like eight inch thick, uh, like semi-opaque acrylic. And so they, they open up and it's really pretty. If you've never seen a laser cutter, and apparently the people that we were presenting to these executives and not, like it was really easy. It was like six cuts. But they look at it like, oh. Right, so the chief executive stands up in the middle of their presentation. She goes, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, we want to just stop you here and say, we would like to fund you. We want to provide all the materials. We want all the teams to actually build these full scale. Um, and the unveil is in six weeks. So, so the kids are like, what? I'm like, what? <laughs> So it wasn't cool. I mean, it was cool. But it wasn't cool. So, so we hustled back, right? So we get back to our uh, to our lab, and uh, the Ice Castle team had by far the most elaborate design. They, theirs was going to be they, the people from EPB explained to me on the side that like they wanted to showcase theirs in their biggest window, and whatever. So I think like Frozen, kind of Elsa's Ice Castle, that was the inspiration here. So uh, they start throwing down some sketches and like thinking through their design, and uh, this kid. Um, it starts drawing, you can see on the, I think it's right for you too, yeah, the right side, the triangles for the spires. So they thought that they would use the CNC router to cut out triangles, and they would all be like leaning in to make this sort of conical looking spire to make the tops of the towers. The problem was that EPB told us exact specifications of how tall the tower had to be. So this kid looks at it, and he was, uh, let's, let's say he wasn't like, he's not in the brochure. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> 
not like the, the, pro, the poster child for academic success, right? So he looks and he goes, hey, wait a minute, we're going to cut that flat, and we'll know how tall it is when it's flat, or how long it is, but when we lean that into the middle, like, we're going to lose a little bit of height, won't we? I'm like, yes. Right? <laughs> I'm biding my time. I, I really want to tell you the answer here. He goes, he goes, how do we know how tall? We know how tall it has to be here, but how do we know how long to make it? And I, I want to jump all over it, right? But before I could say anything, like I just kind of sit there going, mm -hmm, I want to tell you that. He, he pulls his phone out of his pocket, which was okay in our school. And he gets on the internet, which was unlocked in our school. And he looks and he goes, oh, it's, it's just a, it's going to be a pretty simple trick, right? I'm like, well, that's going to help, yeah. <laughs> so, so he starts doing some calculations and about 10 minutes later, he kind of shows me what he's got. I'm like, I, I think that's right. And, so he runs down the hall to the math teacher. He didn't know I taught math before. So he runs down the hall to the math teacher. And he gets the math teacher. Math teacher checks. He's like, "Yeah, I think that's gonna work." So the kid runs back. And he's stoked. And again, like, like this is a skater dude. He's not all about math or school. And uh, like he walks in and he sits down. I'll never forget. He sits down. He looks at his team. He's like, "Hey, like that trick stuff is pretty useful." <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so they start working, right? They finish their designs, they get most of their like sketches and calculations and blueprints done, and I only managed to salvage a handful of the stuff that they had because they were, you know, in that process was messy and they're crumpling paper and whatnot. So uh, Leah is one of the other team members. So this team was not stacked academically. Uh, Leah was emerged as the team leader. She was a, a kind of the poster child for the kid that will fall through the cracks, right? So she was quiet. She never ran her mouth, uh, so she, she didn't get in trouble, right, because she was, she was quiet and sat there. She was complicit. She always turned stuff in on time, and she had pretty handwriting. Um, <laughs> so like all the things that you want in a successful adult, right? Um, <laughs> but the things we reward in school, typically, right? So she's, she's doing all of these things, and uh, she, she looks at me when they're done, and she's like, okay, I think we're ready to go to the computer and start working on, like, designing this. And, if you use, we have a ShopBot, was the brand of CNC router. They've got a proprietary version of more or less of a CAD software. So we go, she's like, I need to use that, I think. I'm ready to start designing in there. So I take her to the computer, and uh, we spend about five minutes working through the mechanics of the software. I kind of click here to do this sort of thing. Uh, once we did that, I, I backed away. I went and helped other kids. This was sort of our model. Turn them loose. We'll come back and help. I just told her not to run anything. We would come back and kind of check for safety reasons and make sure before we ran. She never used the router. Uh, and I took the key, so. <laughs> it's a dangerous machine. <laughs> so, uh, so I come back from working with these other kids after 10 minutes or so, and uh, she hasn't moved, which was unusual, because she, she was a good kid. She would, she would have been working if, if something wasn't up. So I asked her, like, you know, what, what's going on? And uh, she made, at that time, what was probably the most honest and indicting statements I've ever heard from a student. She says, she goes, Coach Stone, she's like, I'm, I'm only good at school, like, you know, like, like writing papers and taking tests. She goes, I don't think I can actually make anything that matters. She was literally frozen. Yeah. <laughs> um, while working on a frozen castle. <laughs> There's some about a few were there. <laughs> right. Uh, so, that, that broke my heart. Like, I just, I remember thinking, like, yeah, that's going to be my daughter. Like, that better not be my daughter. <laughs> Like, my daughter is growing up in a house with two parents who are teachers, and she's going to grow up good at school. And, like, God, that's awful. <laughs> she's a junior in high school and can make that statement. Like, I, I'm good at tests, and I, I can't do anything that matters. So what we did was over the next, then about six weeks, uh, she worked with, we brought in engineers from EPB that were just in the space. They never held class. They never gave a lecture. They were just there and were available occasionally. She worked with them. She did quite a bit of online tutorials. And uh, essentially, single-handedly, um, she designed and she built this. So, yeah, uh, it's 12 feet tall. It was 10 feet deep, 30 feet long. And um, what was uh, what was amazing was that at the reveal, the uh, they had this. They did this whole like red carpet reveal. It was beautiful, right? They brought out the media. It was glitzy. It was glamorous. Everybody loved it. It was great for the kids. When it was over, like as, as, they, as they were doing the reveal, there was a media reporter there, and she interviewed uh, Leah. He interviewed Leah. And while he was interviewing her, after he finished, he turns the camera off. He goes, so you're pretty good at this. Uh, like, you, must be, you must be a great student. And this was great. She goes, sir, I guess. Thank you, but I'm not just a good student. Like, now I think I can make anything. Oh, 
<laughs> That's what it's about, right? Yeah, no doubt. You, you want to rethink and remake education. You, you rethink the, the you rethink the purpose. You redesign the process. What happens? And then you really empower kids, and you empower them to really shine. Thank you for the time this morning.